Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Covenant Cast. I'm your host, Zach. And I'm Steven. And I am Jonathan. And today, on episode three, we're going to be answering the question, should tabletop games go digital? All right, so what have you guys been up to this week? Well, uh... First of all, <laughs> we're brothers. John yeah, there's I, two of them. So if you're listening at home and, and people viewing obviously can see the similarities. But yeah, we've been on videos before, but yes. there's always questions about like doppelgangers and this kind yeah. of thing. Uh, yeah, well, we're brothers. We're, we're rarely on the same video. <laughs> right. Yeah, we're yeah, in the true. same place like Superman and Clark Kent. The, 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 the <laughs> Here we are. Video <laughs> Myth busted. I did it. So yeah, so if you're hearing Jonathan right now, Jonathan is my brother and I am his brother. Mm -hmm. uh, That's how that works. Technically, I am your brother because you were are born first. Are you guys stepbrothers yeah. now? <laughs> 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 Ooh, we're throwing it back to episode two. <laughs> Swoosh, joke. Um, okay, so... Luckily our voices are, are way different. They're not are, as different as our looks. Our looks are fairly similar. They are somewhat different, voices, yeah. quite different. Uh, so here's what's going on okay. this past yeah. week. Uh, played through a campaign of the core set of Arkham Horror. Finally got around to really just sitting down and, and running through the full campaign. Had played some standalone scenarios and checked out mechanics of various things. And you uh, got smoked. <laughs> yeah. Saw the cultist and said... We didn't get smoked, we just chose to leave. <laughs> we, it's called resigning. Uh, it's, it's is, that, is that like when a wrestler just leaves the match? Uh, yeah. It's but like, I'm out. But not... It, you leave the match because you didn't want to get hit with the chair, basically. Mm -hmm. So it was like... We, you know, we made a lot of mistakes. If we had known the way that things were going to transpire in terms of the scenario, uh, we would have done things differently. But we were just... You know, tooling around, trying to get clues, and we had like 18 to 20 clues and didn't saved spend up, <laughs> and then it moved on uh, yeah. randomly, and it was like, uh-oh. So then five cultists uh, appear, and and then like the, there's a tentacle thing, an ancient <laughs> thing going on <laughs> that I snuck into the, you know, I used uh, uh, skids, and I, I had this brilliant play where I moved in where all these five cultists were, and they were going to wreck me, and then I played the evade all of them and move to an adjacent location, mm -hmm. which put me into the secret cave, but that then revealed uh, the ancient like, monster. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, no. Uh, oh, no, there's a monster here. And so then uh, my only choice was next turn leaving uh, the monster and uh, taking the, the licks from that and then resigning, and then we all just kind of like left as soon as possible. So <laughs> that, that really reminds me of Incredibly the Rings, where it's like any time in a quest you're like, ah, oh, we're so far ahead, let's just take it slow. You then immediately just get slammed because yeah. it's like all that extra time we had we didn't really have, but we didn't know it until we got to the next day. We definitely felt in control, but then sometimes Arkham like just throws this random string of events at you that like stacks up <laughs> three or four doom out of nowhere, and it's like oh we're about halfway there, like we we can take our time a little bit, and then it's like reveal this thing, put a doom over here. If this thing gets a doom, put a doom on the thing, and then make this guy move over here, and then he's going to get a doom, and then it's just like, well, the whole thing is over. So, But it was incredibly fun, uh, very addicting game still, and uh, looking forward to taking that same crew. It's kind of like getting a role-playing group together. Taking that same crew and then continuing onward, mm -hmm. having gotten no experience really from the original <laughs> thing. So it's but not you ideal. Get, one but... of your guys got uh, like recurring nightmares, so yeah. there's that. So yeah. you got Games, some negative experience. Some negative things. Yeah. 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 Which is one thing that I love about Arkham is being able to, that character deck traveling on with you. I it was so funny. Cool. I Literally, the uh, it was kind of a portent, I guess, is the first, the first part of the game, literally, I sit down to play, and the first thing that I draw uh, of the turn is the weakness where I discard my hand. Uh, and so it was just like, well, uh, there it is. I mean, it's like, at least it's out of the way. That's at so the, awesome. The most critical point in the game when you need to start, like, you have all of the cards that you just mulliganed, you know, to have the best hand probably you're ever going to see gone. in the game, and they just went away. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's a very unforgiving game, and I like that about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it should be hard. Yeah. Beware, Don, which is not easy. Ah. What about you? What have you been up to? Uh, well, I've been uh, actually working on the Arkham Tokens, uh, doing another revision. Uh, we actually got a bunch of good data from Steven's play session. That's kind of why we played. Actually, yeah, so we got that. That's going very, very well. I went through sort of the ringer yesterday on one of the tokens, Supply Token, and it's looking very good. So that's great. Uh, also redesigning the website. Also designing an entirely new visual ID for Covenant. So... A lot of design work, um, a lot of new things on the horizon, a lot of exciting things and on the horizon. And for those at home that may not know, John is the art director. <laughs> art director, <laughs> lead designer, designer etc. Design. He does all the design, we, I mean, all the tokens only, and all that. We, we talk in, we talk in <laughs> fancy terms, right? It's There's eight people here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, We're yeah. not getting there's too eight, ju Literally just today, I hired a, a, the, eighth. Uh, the eighth. That's what I've been Grant. doing. Oh, yeah. That's right. Sorry. Sorry. Take that away from me. That's right. 
Uh, but like, yeah. So I mean, you always I, I, the titles are weird, but it's like he just does all the design. There's marketing, yes. which is Jonathan, myself, and Ben is behind the camera, or if you're listening, nowhere to be seen. And then <laughs> you space. have Robert over there on the ops side, uh, he does all customer service and shipping and all of that, and then has uh, three people. Uh, under him, Ryan, now Grant, which is nice, and Tim, of course, who is the main retail store guy. So, old, old Tim. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, you know, you say art, you hear art director, and, and like, it's like, oh, oh hey. man, look at these. He must have a staff yeah. of 82 people <laughs> designing <laughs> for him. I just, sometimes sometimes, the sometimes I look in the mirror, and that's about the <laughs> most staff yeah. that I have. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Zach, All right, so well, now's what... your chance to shine. Baby. Well, since you took that away, uh, <laughs> and speaking of looking in the mirror, I saw Beauty and the Beast, the movie. Oh. Uh, that was very good. There's this funny scene in the, with the mirror, so just oh, watch okay. that. Uh, been in testing for the Hoth Open. X Wing, we're going to Adapticon mm -hmm. this week. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Very excited about and that. And I officially decided to go back to Imperial. I was tired of Finally. Rebels, and uh, I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. I know that the list I was running is really good, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, hired a guy, and also we had our five-year story anniversary. So oh, nice. Yeah, that's pretty that. cool. Yeah. So Grant gets in on the five-year anniversary of the store. That's pretty sweet. He yeah. kind of got through all the <laughs> crap. <laughs> <laughs> he he yeah. signed up for the good phase. <laughs> Whoever wasn't around in 2015, it's a definitely a different company before and after. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very true. Yeah, ben nods his head in the background. <laughs> uh, that said, though, there is one other thing that happened this week that I feel like it's worth mentioning before we get into the main topic of games going digital. I have one too. Which is the Destiny spoilers hit. Yeah. Uh, and there were a couple. Ooh, there was an F50 yeah, article with yellow right. cards. There was an SWDestiny.com post with like four speed, which is insanity. And then there was, I think Tiny Grimes even posted a, a spoiler. Um, nice. I'm trying to remember what the card was. It wasn't as good as four speed, so I don't really remember. There's it. only four two. Speed's got the yeah. There's I, only I, two that I care about. Blaster. It had two specials on it, and it has three. Oh, it is. It is the blaster with Jen on it. It's the yeah. three cost thing. Yeah. There oh, is. and it's got like a bunch of different specials you yeah, can resolve. It, yeah, it's got three different. Shield. It's like oh, screen. okay. Okay. So, new spoilers. Uh, we're all excited about Destiny. Um, you have some thoughts? I have a lot of thoughts. I, I'm, I'm, Rebel, I know, I've been uh, hearing you in the background grumbling. Uh, well, pending, pending the previous podcast about game balance, I think we have a perfect case in point for the, the, what I'm always trying to talk about. So there's obviously... Get your popcorn. Right? There's, <laughs> there's obviously two, there's two concepts at work here. Uh, one, when, it, when I think of Destiny, I think of essentially two things. I think of action economy and the back and forth that, that we have as players, which I think is really the heart and soul of the game, that there's... When we first were playing, there was never an opportunity when I didn't have a chance to react to something. And so I always felt like the game was very much up to when and how you're controlling your opponent's dice, when and how you're keeping your dice from being controlled. And it never felt unfair because you always had an opportunity, even if you didn't have the card or the money to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. But that was on you because you didn't draw the card and you didn't have the money, you didn't plan ahead, or you didn't save the card from last turn. So you had to make a lot of hard choices. Uh, and as we see with Han Rey and these kinds of things, but for those that don't know... Which we didn't know about up front. Yeah. It wasn't a thing that you could do. Yeah, for those that don't know, in Destiny, there are cards like uh, Rey has an ability, and there's Jenga who kind of has this quasi-ability as well, which essentially gives you an extra action so you can do things like like roll a bunch of dice in and then immediately resolve them without having to worry about them being messed with. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, has always felt a little bit like this is where the abuse of the game is going to be. Like if you can start stacking up four or five, six actions, then it just becomes you're resolving your whole turn and I hope that I can survive among the wreckage mm -hmm. and do something at least as good as what you did, which yeah. is most of the time very rare because removing a character is the best form of removal in that game. Uh, so we got two new cards, and I think they speak directly to what we're talking about with balance. One is four speed, and honestly, it's the the lesser problem to me. I think it's going to be a very strong card. Um, it's doing a lot of the same stuff that we've already seen in the game. It's better. I mean, it's it's going to create problems because you're going to have turns of four actions in a row. You didn't get to do anything the entire time. You lost your character before you even had a chance to react, and now... Oh my gosh. It will happen rarely, at mm. least for now. But it tells me that Lucas isn't afraid to put action chaining into the game. And I started to ask myself why, and I think Lucas has always thought of this game as kind of like a Street Fighter style game on the tabletop. Did. Choose your favorite Star Wars characters, fight them against each other in kind of this quick game. And so I think this is his way of of creating combos like they are in fighting games, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you'll punch and kick and block and hoo-hoo, and then somebody will type in the combo, and it's like punch, kick, roundhouse, send you up into the air, jump up, hit you back down kind of stuff, uh, like Smash Brothers or whatever. So I think this is, in his mind, what he's trying to do with action chaining. So 
fair enough on him. Maybe it works. Maybe it's enjoyable. Maybe it gets banned. Who knows? Mm -hmm. My biggest problem is a planned explosion. <laughs> <laughs> Which this, they revealed in their article. This card, the I think, is, is the definition of a straight-up mistake when it comes to designing this game. Woo! An Drop absolute some mistake. Heat. There, is, there is one thing about this game that is so essential, and that is that your options are coming from the dice on the table. Lucas talked about in his interview, it's all about the dice on the table. It's all about using those dice and not taking away from the dice with cards. He wants to keep the action on the dice. Well, Planned Explosion says, if you have dice showing at least 10 or more across any symbols, doesn't matter what the symbols are, any symbol, just the numbers, count the numbers. Mm -hmm. If it's 10 or more, you can remove all of your dice and do 10 damage to a character, which is most characters' full health. Yeah. Okay, so what we've done here <laughs> is we've taken the single most important element in Star Wars Destiny, which is the fact that dice are presenting interesting and unique options that are limiting your actions and my actions and their effectiveness on the board and the interplay there. Like if you roll, uh, for instance, a two gun and a plus two gun, I can say, uh-huh, I can control this black gun and the modifier is now useless. So that's kind of a balancing mechanic. Or like let's say you come in and you just chut out a roll you were hoping for big damage, and it's like two resource disrupts, you know, one resource, one card disrupt, like that kind of stuff. And it's like, okay, now he can control me with those dice. Those are his options. Or he can reroll and try to hit damage instead. Mm -hmm. What Planet Explosion does, it takes that, takes that play completely out of the game. Because you can be showing control and then convert it to damage at will. It, it's simply, I roll the dice, and if I get enough numbers, I can do 10 damage regardless of if I roll damage, if my dice have damage sides, if I teched my entire deck to be doing damage, like mm -hmm. all of these things don't matter. So not only can you now play a control deck like Jabba or something that rolls in and just boom, ace that character, mm -hmm. which is crazy. But like the one thing that holds heavy aggro back is I just didn't roll well. And now maybe you can, you know, feel your anger or whatever or force misdirection, get rid of some stuff. But now with a combination of action chaining and my dice symbols don't matter anymore, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like why? That's what, that's the only question I have, is why would you ever do this? It's literally like, it's literally like... <laughs> this could be way too long of a conversation. <laughs> if I had a card that was like, discard your hand and do 10 damage, that kind of stuff. Like, it doesn't play to the game. Well, this I, is not what the game's supposed to be about. I think, uh, in, in no way am I ready to posit a defense <laughs> of this card. <laughs> but I, it, It's not I, about I, it being good or anything, I, it's just why would you do that? You're taking away the entire... Couple, couple of thoughts from me. One in particular, what was the name of this card? Planned Explosion. Planned Explosion. Uh, is it's that... free. Yeah, that's the... Why? That is questionable. Uh, but the <sighs> thing crazy. to me is that, you know, a lot of times people right now in Destiny will consider control anything that manipulates dice. Mm -hmm. And I very much don't think that's control in Destiny. I think control is... Like you said, the best form of control is removing a character. And why is that? It's because you're literally removing dice. Yeah. Like, out of the game. So to me, prize possession is control. Um, disarm is control. And so even with something like um, Force Speed, which is a zero-cost upgrade that has to go on a blue character, one, I prefer that way more to like a Ray or a Django. Absolutely. Where it's on a die it's and at least it, a result related. has to be rolled in, and then it has to be on the board probably for a turn before you get, unless it's on Ray, uh, and you have a double action. Is But like that is that is why I don't like it. I, I love Ray, but I don't like Ray. Um, so I like that way better to like Ray or Django's ability. Mm -hmm. In general, I don't actually think it's a problem. I think it will be a problem because of Ray already existing. Mm -hmm. Like you will be able to chain it, you will get four or five actions, yeah. and it will be hard to stop. But that said, control naturally in any card game I've ever played, control wins because you put stuff on the board, I make it not do anything, and somehow I generate an advantage over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems right now with like Jabba Vader, and it's a really strong control deck, I think it's close to being good enough is that it doesn't really, outside of potentially winning by discarding deck, it doesn't gain significant advantage the longer it lives. Mm -hmm. It just is living to this end game. So I could easily see something like Planned Explosion allowing control decks actually to be viable in a sense that like as long as I'm building upgrades and keeping you from doing anything, I have a way to win that's not just discard your deck, mm -hmm. uh, which is like a, I can kill you through this thing. I also think pure aggro doesn't probably won't need to play this card to do the damage. Like, I'm thinking about my Han Ray deck, and it's like, on my starting dice, Han has a three, mm -hmm. and I have two of those at six. Ray has a two twos. Yeah. So it's like, I could roll 10. I think it's a red card, though. But I could roll 10. It's yellow. 
Oh lord. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could roll ten on that. Uh, yeah. And like the two on Ray's convert into damage, but like that's actually, and you know, I don't have to spend the money on Hans uh, two threes technically, but like that's not really too much more damage than I probably would have been doing anyway. And so like. I think philosophically, though, you're probably it's it's not that I don't think in use it's going to be too good. Yeah, I just think philosophically you're against this move. Why? Why? Well, yeah, it also just limits why? all design going forward because you have to limit those numbers down so people can't gather that ten super yeah. easily. I mean, right now three damage is amazing. You know, three resources is pretty cool, but like now three resources is just as amazing as three damage all through in the long run. Yeah, yeah, it makes yeah. one with a force way better, brother. Yeah. Like it, it just you're looking now at numbers instead of symbols, and I think the symbols on the die making your turns having to adapt to your options is it's basically taking that out for mm -hmm. that deck and mm -hmm. just saying you don't have to adapt to anything, just roll the numbers. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> Why would you do that? The, I get it. I get it. I get it. The, and, well, yeah, and this is the the costing. I think is ultimately the biggest issue. I mean, especially if you compare it to something like Crime Lord, which basically does the same thing: take a take a character off the board. Yeah, but then you get to use it the whole. Four. You get to yeah. use it for the rest of the turn. All this kind of stuff is crazy. Yeah. So I so I'm go. a huge not fan of that card. I'll say that. Also, cool mini or not. Uh, important things. Eric Lang yes. hired officially. That's a lot of really cool. Our favorite games. We had a lot of uh, talk with him at Gen Con, Rising Sun, and uh, very, others. Very much looking forward to seeing that. Game. Worth checking. He's been working with a cool mini for a long time mm -hmm. now. Uh, so we've seen all of his stuff there at Gen Con. It's cool to have him on staff. And then this Game of Thrones miniatures game Ooh. comes out of nowhere. So at Adepticon, uh, Song of Ice and Fire. maybe, yeah, sorry. Game of Thrones. Pretty much by HBO. So May, like maybe it is different, right? I forget that. Maybe it is uh, going to be there at Adepticon. Maybe we'll get to see who knows what. So at least we'll keep I our eyes open at the convention. Give me a Targaryen there. army, what? All right, let's dive into the topic. So <laughs> should tabletop games go digital? Oh, now, before, before we answer that question, there's a lot of things we have to talk about. So yeah. the first question I want to pose to you guys is, does the physicality of a game matter? Right, well, that's a really good question. I mean, <laughs> so... Uh, yes, I mean, yes, absolutely. So the, the one thing it, when approaching this topic that became pretty obvious uh, over time was that touch, just as a sensory experience, is something that you just don't have in a digital format, right? You just don't. Like when I'm playing, the, the easiest example is Vassal X-Wing versus Real Life X-Wing, mm -hmm. or Tabletop Simulator Destiny or anything, uh, and Real Destiny or Jinteki Netrunner and, and Real Netrunner. There is literally no physical sense of touch with the components that I'm manipulating. Mm -hmm. So I can I can cr pretty much create all the same sounds. I can look at all the same art, even though it's a bit different because on a flat 2D space. But I can at least look. I can hear. I can smell. I can do all of the same senses that I can in a game store or a friend's house or whatever uh, with a digital you know display in front of me. But I cannot touch the pieces. And so already you have four out of five senses being used digitally, mm -hmm. five out of five senses being used physically. So we wonder why does it feel so much more satisfying or real? And it's like, well, this is the full human experience. Mm -hmm. Our entire lives have been about all five senses being engaged with the reality. So if you take one of those away, then naturally you would expect it to feel less genuine, less authentic. A little hollow. And that's where it was hard to pinpoint exactly why the essential nature felt so different. But I think that that's really what it is, is you're literally losing a fifth of the experience mm -hmm. whenever you take it away from the physical space. Mm -hmm. So that's at least something that is on my mind when it comes to physical versus digital uh, for games. How yeah. about you, John? You got, I know you've got all well, sorts I've got, of Yeah, thoughts. I've got all sorts of stuff. And, uh, I think one of the, the biggest things is the communication aspect. And I mean that in a storytelling sense, uh, that the way that you place a card down, uh, the way that you move an X-Wing ship is different in, in Vassal versus in real life. So in Vassal, you say, okay, hey, here you go, Clicks and, and it snaps, down. right? It snaps to there, and it always has that same, the same way of doing things. So for instance, to, to illustrate this point, like imagine a chest, digital chest, right? You're looking down, that's fine. Uh, you say, okay, pawn, move forward. Pawn disappears, you know, it reappears. You say queen, you know, go checkmate that king, disappears, reappears. Now, that is just, that's only one possible way of doing it, but that's the standardized movement that happens every single time in a digital thing. What you're communicating story-wise, if you slam down your queen, checkmate, or if you kind of subtly move your queen, checkmate, that's a completely different story, that's a completely different experience, and that, whereas tabletop, uh, or like a digital format, at least now, uh, where, where we are now, mostly will always snap, even tabletop simulator, it snaps down. Um, the way that you can communicate with your movements 
in a physical space is near infinite uh, and digital is highly constrained. And so that helps that story bring in and that really changes things and makes the experience more varied. Less mathematical, certainly, but, sure. but more varied. And I, that gets back to the human element, right? So that, that I think... I think the obvious thing we have to just cross off the list is playing with other people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the difference between sitting down with, and it's not something to write off in the sense that it's not important. It's probably the most important right. part of the entire thing. But it also kind of goes without saying mm -hmm. that chatting with somebody in a text box mm -hmm. and sitting across from somebody, reading their body language, actually yes. having a real human conversation mm -hmm. with them. Actually, that's why we find this medium so incredibly valuable. It's literally in our, our purpose statement and all that. Mm -hmm. It's like... It's about this human connection that happens mm -hmm. across the table, mm -hmm. right? And you just don't get that nearly as much uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. so, so there is the human element, playing with friends. And if you're sitting somewhere in a physical space, other people might come in and now we have new opponents mm -hmm. and we have new people that might you know, in, entertain and, and be a part of the community. So that obviously has a lot to do with it. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously one, one of the things I wanted to touch on was how much of a tabletop gaming is predicated on the social aspect, the human-human connection. But I, I, I want to pose a question to you. Okay, pose on. Which is, because I think you guys are both kind of heading in that same direction. Um, I, I've seen, I know, um, I used to work in the store on Sundays, it's board game day, and Ben actually would host these, uh, I always say it wrong, Hearthstone? Hearthstone. Hearth? 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 Hearthstone. Like a uh, fire? Hearthstone tournaments, which is this digital card game, mm -hmm. um, if you're unaware. And there'd be 10 to 20 people show up, they each have their device, um, and they're playing this game with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so the question for me is, because I think, you know, when we approach this topic, it's like, technically you can replicate all the mechanics on a screen that you can mm -hmm. in yeah. a game and have the exact same game. So it can't be just that you can have mechanics that are different. Then the next layer is social, but it's like you can technically, we could sit here on our laptops and play Destiny. Mm -hmm. but, but are you there? It's, it's the same thing about if we're having dinner and I pull my phone out, mm -hmm. like we're not having dinner together anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's like I'm staring into a void of attention and alternate reality in front of me. And in order to do that in a way that I can actually pay attention to the screen, I c totally get rid of the rest of this, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. how many of us really are sitting here looking on at a text message or whatever and fully aware of all of our surroundings? Yeah. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't happen. Even without the text, being so, fully aware yeah, of the yeah, like, is a notable true. goal. Just any amount of introspection. <laughs> uh, so if you if you put that phone away, and even if I'm looking at the same, if I have the hearth, Hearthstone cards on the table, even though they don't exist, uh, for I'm not. There's something about it. I'm not lost in this experience. It's a part of the overall experience mm -hmm. that I'm having in front of me, but I'm not so locked into this that I don't notice other things, that I don't feel other things, that I don't hear and smell other things. So I think that's that's one of the big differences is you and I can be sitting here staring at a screen like this or, or a Nintendo Switch or whatever mm -hmm. it is, Zach don't say anything, and, but we're not here. Right. We're, we're checked just, out. We're just not here. We, yeah. we checked well, out. I think yeah. that's what I wanted to get to, right? I think that's so critical and because you're, you know, you're saying you're taking away one of your five senses, mm -hmm. right, which is touch. And I think when you take that away, there's a physicality that is lost both in terms of literal my hands are touching things, but just your presence mm -hmm. is now funneled through this yeah. mm -hmm. thing versus yeah. versus the physical touch that is required to move a card or a ship it's, or it's a It's limited, right? Puts you're it you're into limiting a it through sort of these mathematical algorithms that represent the visual nature of, of the games. In a physical world, it doesn't have to go through that extra layer. It's, uh, it's right there in front of you. So can we talk about imagination then? Is it, is it the appropriate time? I'm I think ready. we should. Because this, this is another I critical thing about the physicality of games and mm -hmm. why does that matter. Because you have to set up physicality mattering before you can decide if we should go digital. Mm -hmm. yeah. Physica if we decide that physicality doesn't matter, then of course you go digital. Because you can, like you're talking about, instantly errata things, right. instantly patch things. You don't have to worry about releases right. and manufacturing. Or limited, uh, and like uh, limited runs, supply issues. Like literally, if, if Destiny was solely digital right now, like my yelling about Planet Explosion could just get it banned tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, that's easy enough. We'll just remove it from the software. It disappears. Or and changes. put a new one in. Mm -hmm. And like, that's fine. I, heaven forbid I have that much power over anything that happens. <laughs> but uh, so, so there is, it, it is worth mentioning the physicality. And I think imagination is something that we don't talk about nearly enough, certainly as a, as a society, I mm -hmm. would say, but also as tabletop gaming people, 
as fans of of the genre. We often think about it in terms of Zach and I, at least. I know, Jonathan, you're not this way. (laughs) Uh, We think about it as oftentimes a very cerebral experience when we're testing decks together, we're going to tournaments, and there's a mental aspect to it, a competition that's happening. But even so, I think that we're just not as aware of the imagination the, the role that imagination has in our enjoyment of that experience. Uh-huh. We're not understanding it. We're not paying attention to it, but I think it is there subconsciously. Uh-huh. For you, I think it's there consciously. Um, but the physicality leaves room for you to fill in the gaps. Yeah. And why digital doesn't do that, I think, Jonathan, you have the best take on, um, which is that digital is programmed to be a certain way. Yes. It will react the same way Every no matter time. what it is, mm-hmm. right? And so like, I can see the same art in the digital space. I can see the way that a piece is moving mm-hmm. on a chessboard, mm-hmm. but the way that it actually happens in physical space can be inf- almost infinitely varied. That's right? right. You can just change everything as you're, you play your card a certain way, or as you, uh, like, another great example is like, let's go deeper, Street Fighter, the video game, mm-hmm. versus Destiny, the tabletop game. Right. Both trying to accomplish the same things. Right. I get still shots mm-hmm. of the characters and the cards. And I the get rest one, happens in One your image, yes. and then the rest is up here. Yep. Whereas when I'm playing a game like Street Fighter, mm-hmm. I'm not thinking about what's happening, I'm witnessing what's yes. happening. Well, and I, right? I think that, that difference is so key, because like I, I tried to take this analogy and relate it to X-Wing on Vassal and X-Wing in real life. And it's like with, for, I think it carries over, and we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but it was effectively the difference between experiencing something and witnessing an experience, mm-hmm. yeah. which is like Street Fighter, I feel like I'm witnessing an right. experience. Like if Ken and Ryu could like have an experience, I, way, I get way closer to that in a physical medium, right? Mm-hmm. With something yeah. like Destiny, I, I can... Like, I play X-Wing, and I feel like I'm flying ships around. Like, right. I finish a game, and it's like, whoo. It's like the stress of, like, flying <laughs> ships around. I almost hit that rock, you know? Like, that asteroid almost clipped my ship. Like, and yeah. I can feel that. And I'm uh, very much more, the com- like, into the competitive side of it and the math behind it and efficiency mm-hmm. and all that. But even still yet, uh, the theme and the imagination is important. So I think the difference between experiencing something and watching an experience yes. is and, worth pinpointing. And that's the thing, like if you to go Destiny or X-Wing, but Destiny's a really good one-on-one example with Street Fighter, is that whenever you say, okay, Ray does two melee damage, right? In your mind, you're thinking, all right, Ray is like, got there, she I got do that sound a lot right? out, right? It's like, boom. The thing is, every time you do that, it can be different. But every time Guile punches somebody in Street Fighter, someone's already imagined that, and you're witnessing their imagination. Right, so it's like you're eating someone's already digested food, uh, more or less. Uh, <laughs> I got gross. All of a sudden, I'll never play a video game ever again. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's really something to consider: is that you are not, you are not on the threshold of creation. And you know, this is my my artist talking. You're not on the threshold of creation uh, with a video game. You are witnessing what someone else has witnessed and been able to translate for you. Whereas with a tabletop game, so much of it takes place in here, and so much of it is just. Way the imagination is way stronger, right? We still don't have VR that matches dreams, you know. Like our brains are so good at that that instead of instead of fighting against that or instead of like you know let, putting that to the side, exercising that, getting better at that, and then like incorporating that and, and through tabletop games, I think really does pay dividends. Whether we realize it or not, I think it's subconsciously going on uh, forever. For there is a narrative us. going on. It mm-hmm. seems like, mm-hmm. and so much of it seems about this frontier. Mm -hmm. Uh, mentality, right? We've talked about this a lot, how what it must have been like to have a new world, right? Like, that's insane. And so we're we're kind of getting in that with space, but Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll necessarily be in our lifetime. Uh, But this is... Well, this is... (laughs) This is an area where a creative frontier Mm -hmm. is able to be explored because you're the one creating the narrative, Mm -hmm. right? And so nobody's created the narrative that you're creating for this game. That's right. Uh, For traditional, even Zelda or whatever it Mm -hmm. is on on the Switch, so say anything. Uh, You know, that is a world that has been created for you. Right. And it will appear the same to you. It's a crafted world. You were exploring, and this is what I was talking about when we were talking about this yesterday, is that you are, with, with Zelda or any of these games, you are exploring a world that has already been created for you to explore. Uh, and it has limitations because it is limited by the imagination of the person who, or the mad people who have made it. Whereas tabletop games, role playing games especially, it's not limited. There's, there's the limit is only your own imagination rather than this sort of double layer imagination thing going on. So, so the obvious foil here is that 
it's pretty easy to compare, like, you know, the difference between playing a game of Street Fighter and Destiny. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to start to kind of suss out the difference between playing a game of tabletop simulator Destiny and real Destiny, or Vassal X-Wing and real X-Wing, or like we said with tabletop simulator, it could be any game. Mm -hmm. It could be Settlers, it could be chess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I played a ton of, I preferred online chess when I was uh, really big into chess way Mm -hmm. back in the day. Well, it's more efficient, but I also, I had a perfect view of the board Mm -hmm. at all times. There was no perspective to mess with. Same thing with Monster Apocalypse on Vassal. I had this perfect view. The buildings were simply squares. Mm -hmm. You know, the the pawns, (laughs) the pawns were just pawn symbols, Mm -hmm. right? So I felt like I could make the optimal play every time and not lose myself. Whereas when I was playing physically, sometimes I would just have spatially missed the line of the bishop coming Mm -hmm. across the middle of the board. Mm -hmm. So is there something to be gained by imperfection in the spatial world? I actually think that's important too, because I I feel a lot of times what will happen um, when I'm like playing a game of X-Wing in real life, and then like uh, it really happened to me last year from Hoth when we did the commentary on my own game after. (laughs) Yeah. And it was like, when I'm watching it from above mm-hmm. on a camera and I'm not in it, it's like, what are you doing? It's like, this is obvious. <laughs> you should this see thing. that. You, you should, should see this. Yeah. But like when you're here and you're behind your ships and you're at this perspective, it's like, even with the, the chess analogy, right? It's like the, a queen moves up and it's like, that feels more threatening. Absolutely. Than like when you're just overhead in a digital yeah. medium. Mm-hmm. And that's where I like, you know, maybe it's more efficient to play X Wing online because you won't you won't feel that way, right? Certainly, it's more cerebral. You have more. But in but what I was gonna say is, I think that is such an important quality of tabletop. Like when I get done playing X Wing, I feel like I've been flying ships because of that perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, like it's both positive and if you're just looking for mathematical efficiency of a game, potentially negative. But like that's not why I'm here. Mm-hmm. There's something about the the narrative, the experience, the actual the physicality um, of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. just being there. It's, just, it's mean, okay it's a, for it to be imperfect. It's a little bit it's a little bit messy, but that messiness allows us those corners that are created by that messiness allows us to fill in the gaps in a way that. And I actually I would I would posit that if you're playing hyper competitively, hyper competitive like mathematical sort of a, a way, you want digital. I think digital is the best way for that because you. There's so many, too many fewer mistakes. Yeah, but ultimately, that's absolutely true. Yeah, because you can see, you see everything. You have perfect vision, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or as perfect as you can. And then in the physical world, it's much different. Now, the interesting thing is that I still think the physical world wins out, because I think the experience, the, the messy experience, the you know, oh, I forgot that, ultimately makes a better story. And I think we're all, you know, trying to look for the best. story Certainly, possible. a more human well, experience. Well, uh, one thing, and I, we'll we'll get down to that in a minute, okay. because I, th- I think it's important to answer. Uh, we're kind of getting to it already, which is why are you playing a tabletop game in the first place? Right, right. right? Where yeah. it's realistically, it's like if you're wanting to have an experience, an engrossing experience, mm-hmm. or if you're wanting to witness an experience, mm-hmm. like there's a very big difference in why, like why, why digital or why not? Because even then, I remember back in the day with Monster Apocalypse, we used to play a lot online. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things digital is great about is the fact that you can play people from all over the world. That's right. There's like no setup time. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. no takedown time. You just hit a new button and refresh. My, my army's mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. We're ready to go. Let's do it again. Um, there's a lot of the messy messiness of a physical game you don't have to deal with. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of benefits there. And when we were playing, I remember it would be like a month before an event, you know, you've been playing your, your same list over and over again on, on Vassal and with uh, various opponents, I would specifically start switching almost primarily to physical because there is a difference, a very different, like a pin, mm-hmm. pinpoint, I don't know why, mm-hmm. but there's a difference between playing Monster Apocalypse actually and playing it on the screen. I was yeah. much more efficient and made better moves on the screen. Mm-hmm. And then you get engrossed in this game and, and it's visual, and like you can't see the thing behind the building, or you there's a fire there, mm-hmm. and it's, it's like gorgeous. Just, yeah, it's just like the it's threat gorgeous. of mm-hmm. being thrown to the Empire State Building. Mm-hmm. It's like if I just take a second to do the math mm-hmm. and be like, ah, you, you know, you can't do that. Right. You, you aren't statistically going to do that, which is all I'm considering online. Right. When I'm in person, it's like. I'm kind of not wanting to be near it at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's, scary. <laughs> it's like, ah, I don't want to. So I, I definitely think there is that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But then the next kind of thing I wanted to jump to is like you said it yesterday, which was, it stuck with me all night. Um, the difference between seeing a picture of Mona Lisa yeah. and oh, seeing yeah. Mona Lisa yeah, in yeah. person. It's so different. It's crazy. I've never different. seen Mona Lisa, so I, tell well, me about I, it. I, I mean, it's an <laughs> awesome experience. I had the chance to, to go on a, a European trip after college. And 
I went to the Louvre, and of course, there's a ton of people there in that specific building. They have it set up in a certain way to create an experience, right? It's like nothing else is around. It's this sole piece sitting there, right, in the middle of the room. And there is a gravity to the real thing mm -hmm. that a picture is like, it, it's a joke. I mean, it's like, you look at like the- Because it can be my background on my- Yeah, and right. you look at the picture and it's like, sure, it's a, it's a lady, I don't know why it's so important. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen ladies that look better drawn than this, mm -hmm. or better painted, or mm -hmm. more realistic, or more artistically interesting, or whatnot. Uh, but then you go and you see the actual painting and there's just like, there is a soul gazing thing that's going on with that painting that I had never experienced having seen pictures, right? So, that's phenomenal. But this is the beauty of it. And I think uh, is even just from a human level, this is fascinating to me, is that there seems to be an element of mystery mm -hmm. to the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's seeing a card of Ray on a 2D screen represented in pixels, mm -hmm. which are particular building blocks, uh, or seeing a real life Mona Lisa or card mm -hmm. of Ray that Credit is built art. with, mm -hmm. you know, like reality, I don't know, atoms and things. I guess everything's built Molecules. from atoms, but yeah. like, it's just, there's there's some kind of a mysterious appeal mm -hmm. like to, to tangible to things mm -hmm. uh, that we haven't, Maybe VR does it eventually. Maybe, or maybe VR helps us suss out what it is ultimately. Wouldn't that? That's two uses. Yeah, of we've sussed yeah. twice. We're practically shut up and sit down. <laughs> it, the the thing, Heat. The, thing <laughs> the thing about it is that there's there is that mystery, and maybe, and this is something you've you've talked about a lot, is <laughs> we don't know if VR can do it, mm -hmm. but I think it's exciting to put VR as far in the future as possible. Test it. Go there and say, is there actually something missing here? Mm -hmm. Do we feel that something is missing? Well, because, you know, a good example, two VR things mm -hmm. before we get away from any of this is one thing I'm incredibly nervous about is the moment I can put a VR on mm -hmm. and be inside of an X-Wing mm -hmm. and play that universe mm -hmm. and be that character. Mm -hmm. Because like we were saying earlier, instead of watching an experience, the thing that VR is doing for the first time, even Street Fighter, imagine being the character. Right. And it's like you are now having the experience, mm -hmm. which is the the leap that is terrifying. But you know, I the second thing on VR is looking ahead in the future. It's like, is it possible? Right. One of my brothers lives in California. And it's like, is it ever going to be possible for me to put the the VR on or the glasses or the contacts mm -hmm. or whatever, and actually truly feel like I'm in the same room with him, yeah. where I could play Destiny over digital. Mm -hmm. In the same room with him, even though he's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And is that that presents a really fascinating question to me, which is like, if we have VR so powerful that that experience can happen, would you still prefer it to like a full-on Destiny VR experience? Like, let's say you and your brother Daniel could be sitting here with Ray standing in front of you, right. as opposed to having a card. Would you, is there something about the tabletop game? that you would still prefer to a realistic modeling of mm -hmm. the action. Well, mm -hmm. and that's, or, or even better, right? And this is what VR does. It's like, instead of playing Destiny with Daniel, it's like, I can be Ray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I can, the thing you're emulating with this Destiny experience, I can yeah. be. Mm -hmm. But the thing about tabletop, and this is the circle I want to complete, it? is <laughs> while I could be Ray, right? That, that is, even with X-Wing, right? That is dramatically different segments of your brain being challenged to be able to pilot a ship yeah. versus to be able to play a game of X-Wing yeah, or definitely. play Destiny where it's like the physicality required to be Ray would be immense, mm -hmm. yeah. right? To dance around, lightsaber fight, mm -hmm. and like all that. And that is its own, it is its own benefit and experience. Mm -hmm. The thing about tabletop to me is that it is challenging parts of your brain that no other thing is currently challenging on that level. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a combo of the imagination, the intellectual capacity that's being tested by how can you manipulate this game mm -hmm. to produce efficient results, and so on and so forth. And the story, too. And the story too. Any and 3D rendering of Ray is going to be 3D rendered. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's... <laughs> yeah, even well, your then you own, get back down to the physicality. Even if it's you're looking at your own arm and it looks like Ray's arm, it's like... But Ray's arm might look different to you if you're looking at the card and thinking about Ray, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So like this is always just going to be whatever the developer what like, exactly. programmed it's it still to be. Going to the, Even yeah. if that developer's you. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? And I, I think that's what, when you scale back and we get back to Mona Lisa, it's like the same, same reason that the physical painting somehow has a weight and a gravity that the digital doesn't. Mm -hmm. In the same way that like Ray 
in VR, no matter how realistic it gets? And that's the question, right? Can it get so realistic that the weight is there? Mm -hmm. Can it get can so it realistic get... that I can walk into the Louvre virtually and yeah. see the Mona and Lisa. see the Mona Lisa and be hit by the same thing? And like, it's a good question. It's a good question. Then, Probably, right? I don't know. I mean, the, the thing is, that's, if you look, at, mystery, isn't it? you look at uh, you look at MP3s, you look at digital files, right? They're supposed to be the high. You can have the highest possible quality. Flax. Uh, flax. Waves. Even lossless, hip audio please. Guy over here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, vinyl is having a resurgence. You know? Huge. Huge research. You look at um, you look at all of the technology and money and development and time that's gone into CGI. And yet still the best films, Star Wars, are going back to practical effects because there's still something missing. And it's very hard to talk about that without getting into met metaphysical stuff. Because we don't really <laughs> whoa, know whoa. what it is, yeah. you know, what's missing in those areas. But if you want to look at what we, the evidence we have and then extrapolate into that into the future, I think there's a very good case to be made that nothing will replace reality uh, for a reason that we don't know yet. But that I feel, and I think we all feel when we play tabletop games. And there's something about this purely, a, a game that can be played when the lights go out, I think is 100% is different than a game that has to have some sort of electronic input. Even if it's an, an app-based game or whatever, there's, I don't know what it is. You know, I, and I, I've been thinking about this all night because this is the question, obviously. <laughs> Uh, and, but I don't know what that is. Hopefully, maybe somebody does, and they can you know put it in the comments oh, yeah. and help us out. Yeah, yeah. just you know, answer yeah. that. And well, then a new religion will be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I think the you're you're kind of hitting on the head there, which mm -hmm. is I also I, I agree. I don't think that digital will ever advance far enough to replace reality. Right. But if it does, then yeah, that's then what the is reality? That's the new reality, right? right? Maybe I'm right, in VR right. right now, and I just don't know it. Um, so all that said, uh, just to break it down really quick, right? Because I think um, before we kind of conclude a mm -hmm. topic like this, there's a lot of ups and downs to both physical and digital, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like I'm looking at digital and I know that like there's a lot of people who there's been a lot of studies on like the Ticket to Ride digital app and the Catan digital mm -hmm. app, which is get, actually increases the sales of the physical games mm -hmm. because people can download it in their home by themselves, learn how to play, understand that they like it, now that they know they like it, they're comfortable they buying it and yeah. sharing it. But with yeah, friends. it's not a re it's not ever a replacement. They it's go it's an intro, right? Yeah, and, and it's because it's it's easier to access, right? It's faster. Mm -hmm. There's no setup time. It's easier to learn mm -hmm. because you can build in a tutorial to the digital side yes, of this. Yes, very important. It's extremely portable. It's the overall time it takes to do it is way less on digital. Mm -hmm. um, you can connect with anyone in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, so there's some serious benefits to digital. Yeah. On the flip side, you have physical, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think there is a physicality that can't be replicated digitally. Right. You lose a part of the experience. Mm -hmm. You, you're losing out of touch completely. Uh, you can't socially interact the same. It seems to really incite the imagination, too. Yeah, I think so. It feels like I'm in Catan. Mm -hmm. you know? When you're doing it physically. And maybe that's just because, like, whenever you are witnessing uh, the game, I think our brains may be trained to, like, just let that replace our imagination. I mean, there's been plenty of studies done that the sort of brain activities of people watching television programs is actually less than when they're sleeping. Because uh, they, they don't have to be imagination. Yeah, because it's like, well, I just, I mean, I'll just replace that guy's imagination for my own, and then, you know, hopefully and I it's think, good enough. I think that's why people enjoy movies and, and shows so much, is mm -hmm. that it does let you turn your brain off. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. In a way that's still engaged in some mm -hmm. level, right? It's not just like, I'm going to go stare at a wall. Right. Because that's actually harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's way harder. Because, because your mind is just has to do all the work. Mm -hmm. And it's untrained. I mean, especially in you know today's modern age. <laughs> like, people don't get that. And one thing I kind of want to wedge in here is like <laughs> a, a little bit of a tangent. Um, but uh, old man Wally. <laughs> to, sort of, to sort of go on, on what we were talking about, like, the scariest monsters in horror movies are the monsters that are never shown, that live in our imagination. And I think yeah. that can be ex extrapolated with, and that really put a fine point on what we've been talking about here with the, how powerful our human imagination is, human imagination is, especially when it's being engaged uh, in a way that tabletop really, or, uh, analog things can only really, really. And it needs space, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing is like you, these digital things cram so much into the, the periphery that mm -hmm. there is no space for you to explore there's with no your dark own edges, self, yeah, yeah right? exactly. Uh, but seeing that single building on a Catan board mm -hmm. leaves plenty of space. Gives me direction, mm -hmm. but it leaves a ton of space for me to explore what shape. it looks yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's something shape. about like putting like a like a you know a, a topaz or what a, a meeple on a, a some place in uh, uh, Puerto Rico. Yeah. yeah, it's and just thinking about it now, me seeing it on the board versus me seeing it on a computer. When I see it on a computer, it's 
almost mathematical, you know. And it's when always I say, is. It must be, right? Yeah, it's I mean, and it's it's that old vinyl argument. It's just warmer, you know. Again, what does that mean? Uh, it's but just, it's just warmer. It's, I like gotta, the mystery, though. Yeah, I like the mystery. So physicality, I think, does matter. It's, it does it's obviously matter. there's, regardless of if you know why, it is not a clear parallel mm -hmm. between Vassal Tailout Simulator Jinteki Net versus the real games. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing to stress here is that you have to answer why you're playing the game. Mm -hmm. If you literally just want a mathematical challenge, yeah. and mm -hmm. that is why you're there, digital games are great for that. Yes. Right? Like, I, I know plenty superior, of people honestly. that play Ticket Definitely to Ride by superior. themselves on their phone, mm -hmm. and it's like, that is almost 0% of why I'm at a tabletop game. Right. It's mm -hmm. just just the challenge. Um, but at the same time, like that's that's worth keeping as mm -hmm. part of that conversation. So before we actually answer, final before we get to final <laughs> thoughts, I have a question for you guys. I know you guys have RPG'd a lot. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Really yeah. Your background yeah, is how you guys started. Yep. Yeah. Um, so explain to me the difference between if the three of us right now and, and Ben played an RPG session right here. Right. And the four of us at different parts of the world on video, on Skype, mm -hmm. doing an RPG. Because mm -hmm. it's one of the few games where there's a lot less analog pieces happening. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with something like Skype, Skype video, um, you can see the person. Yes. You can hear the person. Yeah. Uh, so any any takes on that? Is that is that any less of an experience? Man, I, is I important? honestly don't know. I think it's. I do think again, looking at evidence we have and extrapolating it, I think it's definitely worth noting uh, that at least in my understanding of the world, the idea of like tele role playing didn't really come about until we had web video. So people weren't getting on their phones, you know, on a on a party line or whatever, and role playing. Some people undoubtedly some were. Some people were, and some people were doing it on say, chat rooms, assuredly. But it didn't um, blow but it, up. It, it wasn't blown up. I used to play. I forgot what it was. Yeah, it's about communication, though. Right? It's about it's and that's and so one of the things that I really want to bring up, and because I've, I've ever since I've heard this, I think this is absolutely fascinating, is that twenty percent, roundabout, uh, or less. Of human communication. Whenever I'm talking to you, whenever you're talking to me, uh, whenever people are listening to the podcast is watching or watching it is word choice. Only 20% is word choice. So if you're chatting with someone, you're only getting 20% of what you want to get across. So you're saying our podcast listeners are getting 20% of no, the No, no, episode. because they hear our tone, they hear our inflection, mm. um, they, they hear don't that see kind of, us. They now don't the YouTubers, see us. Now the YouTubers do. They see me. They're using seeing the whole my thing. Yeah, all they this see way. the little smiles, right? Yeah, the yeah, little yeah. Funny faces. And so much of that is is part of the interaction that, that human beings have that is missing uh, in, in digital. And that's why you have to have, you had to have video, I believe, to really allow this uh, disparate group uh, geographically of people to play role-playing games in, in a you know, popular way. Which yeah. is really cool. And I, I think it's actually important, so to use your analogy of mm -hmm. the um, communication, right? Mm -hmm. We only get 20% of it from the boards. Yes. I think with a tabletop experience, there's some percentage, we'll call it 20. Mm -hmm. You only get 20% from the actual playing of the game. Right. Like the, the mechanical right. playing of the game. Right. And I think the other 80% comes from everything else. Yeah. The person across the table, the interaction with the pieces, yeah. the art. And it's really, I think what we're trying to figure out is what percentage of it is not the human element. Mm -hmm. Because that may well be 79%. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I'm thinking about what it's actually like to play a physical mm -hmm. space. And we, we talked about the thought experiment of, you know, would you play Settlers of Catan with five cyborgs? Mm -hmm. is, that, <laughs> is that the same kind yeah. of physical experience? Well, and, but there still is something there. There's a percentage that is the actual That's where, like, when I break it down, right? So it's like, if I'm, and this isn't percentages, but it's preferences, which is, my last preference is to play X-Wing Online. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. That's like, and I will do it if it's like, I really want to play against this person, right? Like, mm -hmm. I can't play against Theorist because he's on another part of the country. But, like, that's, like, the end of the line. Like, I really need to be in, I need X-Wing to do that. Mm -hmm. Then, because you introduced the idea of a cyborg, right? Because I was trying to pinpoint whether the person mattered or not. Yeah. And it was, like, on the other end, my favorite is human-to-human X-Wing, mm -hmm. right? Full on, I don't, I don't even like proxies. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. you want to see the ships? I don't like board. proxy ships. I don't like proxy cards. And there's yeah. a reason for at that. all. Yeah. Um, it, so that's my ideal. And then ultimately, in the middle, would be playing X Wing in real life against a robot. Mm -hmm. I would still rather do that than play against a real human online, online. which was <laughs> fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that weird. actually brings up, I think, an interesting foil, which may be a whole different podcast. Uh, but the foil to all of this is solo play. Solo play Lord of the Rings, solo play Arkham Horror. People get a lot out of it. I still remember very vividly someone coming up to me in Worlds, uh, and he was talking about the tokens and, and how much he enjoyed them and how much it helped his experience, but that he was sort of like moved emotionally out through solo play 
uh, watching all this stuff go down. And the th but even like thinking about it in my head, solo play online or solo play in a digital format, and solo play with a, just a, you and a stack of cards and you know some wooden tokens or something like that's different, it's you know, so and, different. It, and it's and why? <laughs> <laughs> it's so that's a good question. So uh, final thoughts: Should tabletop we didn't answer games... the role playing question good. by the way? Oh yeah, so no, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I honestly, not final thoughts. I actually can't decide if there would be any difference. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I'll tell you the the one thing that I think there's, there's no physical components really, right? Well, so. you can I mean, getting getting metaphysical, you can feel people's energy better. Sure, but uh, I mean, so I, maybe one percent. Yeah, I was gonna say I think there's probably a sm small percentage loss. It's mm -hmm. sort of like when you copy a thing and then you copy the thing and you mm -hmm. copy the yes, thing. Yes, no, and you start ex no, that's exactly right. Yeah, and so really you weird. start with the three of us here playing right in our role playing session, and then it's like, all right, well, if we move to Skype. You lose a little bit of the quality. Mm -hmm. You definitely do. And mm -hmm. then if if you move to like three of us are on Skype and one of us is on chat, mm -hmm. you, you're starting to lose a lot more quality. Yep. And honestly, the real question you have to ask: all the people playing on Skype role playing sessions, would they rather be playing in person? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think a hundred percent of them that's would. A really good question. Yeah. So that said, final thoughts: should tabletop games go digital? Uh, and this is actually entirely relevant given Fantasy Flight's XCOM, Descent, mm -hmm. Manchester Madness, app-based things, mm -hmm. trying to get that worked in there. Um, should they go digital? There is a space for digital games that are tabletop games, mm -hmm. right? And this is really good for chaining out games for competitive purposes, for cerebral purposes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, honestly, one of the greatest joys in my life when I was getting ready for Worlds a couple years ago for Netrunner like, I would wake up and I would pull my laptop out and just lay in bed and play Netrunner. <laughs> and that's the dream. Mm -hmm. Really fun. Mm -hmm. Like, I was looking forward to that when I went to sleep, literally. Um, so, there is definitely a place for this, uh, without a doubt. I think, is it, will digital ever replace the physical experience of a tabletop game? Um, I think that given the mystery that we've pulled out here, I certainly, the romantic in me, wants to say never. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. of course not. Uh, the only way that it's possible is virtual reality. But think about what virtual reality is. Mm -hmm. It's simply creating a new reality that has the same characteristics of our traditional reality. Yep. So even then, virtual reality isn't really digital, right? It's, it's something different. It's essentially this experience, but somewhere else, <laughs> and looking different, right? Yeah. So that's where it could happen. But I think digital has its place, physical has its place, uh, and that if you've never played some of these games physically, like I know a lot of people who've only played Destiny on Tabletop Sim or only played X-Wing on Vassal, uh, I think you should give it a shot, if mm -hmm. at all possible, to, to get in the physical space and play it and feel, pay attention to how different it feels and how different that experience is. And it just feels so much more wholesome and holistic and real. Mm -hmm. uh, and wherever that mysterious percentage of realness is coming from, we can't particularly know. Uh, but it's there. And and that gets me to the app-assisted stuff. Is there a line that can be crossed where an app is telling you all the things to do mm -hmm. and you're not messing with the components as much in this kind of a thing? Seems like there would be. I was given, gonna say, I, given think, the I think that is actually a whole episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Given it's like the conversation how, how, that we've how can had. technology integrate versus replace as well? But I'm glad that there at least are some attempts. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you gotta explore. All we can do is find out when it stops feeling right. Mm -hmm. Just I think experiment. I think sadly enough, mm -hmm. as a man who's so cerebrally bound as myself, having to rely on feeling to make any kind of decision is <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> but I'm willing to do it in this instance. Yeah. Uh, what about you, uh, Jonathan? Um, well, I think uh, Two things, really. Um, the human interaction element, I think, is a, is a really big deal. And I think, to put it into, ex uh, give an example. If you play Vassal online versus if you play in a store, if you play in a store, you are giving someone the chance to help you move your ship. Whether or not they ever take that, it's different. You know, but we've seen plenty of competitive things, like... If you're in digital, the computer's moving your ship. It doesn't matter. But how much of a different story, how much of a different experience is it if someone's like, oh, yeah, I can get that for you, right? Automatically now, it's a whole different world. And actually, I think really that, that speaks to my second point, which is uh, you were talking about filters. And everything digital is filtered in some way. You know, I'm, I'm a video guy, or I started out that way. And whenever you take a shot, uh, there is an absolute limit of light and an absolute limit of darkness. Now, the human eye 
perceives way more than that. Because if you're t- taking a picture of the sun, like the human eye perceives an immense amount more than that. And so for every layer of, of digitalization, you are putting this sort of mathematical framework outside of our own, you know, whatever you want to call it, framework of quarks and string theory and whatnot. Uh, that is literally, I mean, by, by its very nature, it's not wrong. clipping. Yeah. Sorry, clipping a little bit of the, uh, <laughs> the just maybe spit on Zach. Yeah, the reality. Uh, clipping a little bit of, of actual reality. One of the so benefits of digital. If you want the the whole <laughs> experience, spit. literally the whole experience, the only way to do it is physical. Same thing with uh, with audio, right? You see the same thing there, mm-hmm. where analog actually has smooth curves, whereas digital, no matter how good you get, is still pixelated. And the amazing thing there too is that there are lower frequencies that the human ear can't technically perceive, mm-hmm. but that you can feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you don't know. I mean, you don't know it, but when you listen, it's like something's different. It's not your hearing. Mm-hmm. You're hearing the exact same you're thing, feeling it but there is a frequency that is literally hitting your body in a different way. Interestingly, mm-hmm. digital is again taking away the feel sense mm-hmm. of that experience, mm-hmm. even with music, right? It's why it's That's different funny. to hear someone yeah. live or on a vinyl, because vinyl produces those things, mm-hmm. those those things that you feel. Yeah. A little less than live, but yeah. as close as we can get, so with current technology. So yeah, so should tabletop games go digital? I think I think a case can be made if you want to have a pure mathematical competitive experience that tabletop games should go digital. But I think the the facts speak for themselves that even with Catan, Ticket to Ride, etc., the digital version uh, of it increases the sales of the physical version uh, almost 100% of the time. Yeah, I think, for me, I think the answer is yes, but in a certain way, right? I don't think it should go digital in a way that's trying to replace. Mm-hmm. I think it should go digital in a way that it can accomplish things that you can't accomplish physically, mm-hmm. like getting people into the game that wouldn't have gotten into the game, teaching people, playing people you couldn't have played. Mm-hmm. And I think that's totally fine, but mm-hmm. it shouldn't be seen as this is going to replace tabletop. I mm-hmm. think that's the... Same thing with books. It's the same, like, people are so concerned. It's like, MP3s are going to destroy physical, and books are going to destroy digital, and it's like, books still sell. Yeah. Suddenly the masses cried out and and said, no, we are real. (laughs) Yeah, I I used to think it was just strictly the, like, nostalgic, like, oh, people want to buy the old Nintendo because, like, they want to play the old game, or people want to buy the book because this is what they're used to. Mm -hmm. But I actually now think... That's not the case. Yeah. Like they want the physical thing because it's the physical thing, yeah. and it's that's important. So, in short, a lot, lot, lot to consider there. Digital in a in a certain way. Digital in a certain way, and a lot of mystery to go along with it. Yeah, a lot of mystery. <laughs> and you gotta ask why you're here. Why why are you playing a tabletop? <laughs> not why you're here. That's a different question. But why why you're playing a tabletop game? Oh, would in the you first like place? to ask that, Zach? That, that's a that's a series that needs to happen much, much later. All right, on to the Q&A segment oh, of the great. Covenant cast. Uh, if you aren't aware, you can use the hashtag Ask Covenant on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the internet uh, <laughs> to ask us a question and we will answer digital it. Mediums, right? uh, digital, all the digital things. You could, 20% you could also, of communication. You could works. also use ash, hashtag Ask Covenant in the store, mm-hmm. and that would get accepted. I, I'll that's make true. sure that's yeah. okay. You gotta do this thing up. when you, you gotta do that, yeah. Uh, so the first question comes to us from Philip Karras from YouTube, which is, where do you look for inspiration when designing tokens? Oh, hello. Uh, I've never done it. Let's ask Jonathan. <laughs> all right, Philip. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, how are we doing on time, by the way? Do you don't worry about all that. Right, all right, all right. We're at 10, 15. Um, so <laughs> oh, yeah. How much whenever... time do you have? I'll, I'll like, spit on you when it's <laughs> there, time. All right. Thanks. Just <laughs> return it. Just send it back. Yeah. Uh, there are two main things uh, that I look at for inspiration when designing tokens. Uh, the number one thing is looking at the game, playing the game, uh, getting feedback from people playing the game, and seeing if there's anything that's lacking. Um, seeing if there's anything that could be improved upon uh, that we have the ability to do because we can have longer development time, focus on the tokens more, that kind of stuff. A really good example of this, I think, is Imperial Assault. The base and activations, I love hearing people come back and say, this has really helped my game. Uh, it makes it easier to play. And that's something that we looked at and we were able to say, okay, as we're playing, this is cumbersome. You know, and so we can change that. Well, it's like you're designing the tokens, and then you realize all of these tokens are on the board. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like everywhere and, like, and man, awful. I think so there's a function consideration. There's, there's a function basically. consideration, and then most importantly, uh, there is a just in the massive amount of research, uh, as you guys know. You guys probably don't, uh, but at least you know uh, the better part of the first week of a token assignment. I'm using to look up pictures. I'm using to listen to podcasts, stories. I mean, in the Arkham tokens, I was listening to Lovecraft the entire time for the uh, Destiny uh, tokens. I was listening to an old radio play. By the way, they compatible did, Compatible with Destiny. So the, the, whatever game they're most compatible with is when I, I tried to look into. Destiny, trademarked by. 
<laughs> so anyhow, but I take those, and what I do is I take all the pictures that I can, I can find, and then I begin to draw them. And so I, I draw like a stormtrooper helmet, and I draw a tie fighter. I love the sketches. And yeah, and that really allows me to get in deep because I'm looking for basically every world, every consistent world has a sort of logical design philosophy that usually happens subconsciously, and just like really good designers over a period of time have like caught up on this. But I'm breaking it down to almost a mathematical geometric sort of a thing. So the way that like the way a stormtrooper helmet swoops is actually you can kind of see it again in the way that a tie fighter is shaped, like that kind of this stuff. And you you start looking at a really really good example of this is you can take a uh, rectangle, you round the edges and you put it with four or five more rectangles. All of a sudden you got the Death Star. You're looking at the hallways of the Death Star and from a little pill shape. Now if you take those take those rounded edges off and make them a little bit skinnier and you have the same stack, now all of a sudden you have like a grill shape and it's much more reminiscent of the utilitarian the industrial design of the Rebels, right? Uh, and there's all sorts of crazy cool stuff you can find as you get in there. For instance, uh, another example is that the flag of the First Order is actually uh, mimics the design of the inside of the new TIE fighter. Like the inside so the wing. Yeah, so yeah. if you look inside the wing, where it, it connects to yeah, the, the wing connects body. to the body, is the exact same, the same amount of, of pegs and everything. Depending on what miniature you're looking at, uh, as the as the stuff, and so you start finding these things because, and you start asking yourself, are these the things that are unique to this design that allow people subconsciously to clue in that that belongs to this? It's like, right? I see it. That's Star Wars. That's or Star I Wars. See it, yeah. That's first order. What what makes it Star Wars? You know, and so I'm trying to answer that, and uh, and drawing stuff uh, really allows me to get deep down into the way the lines work, because that's all I really have to work with, you know? I mean, you look at the uh, the uh, templates, and that's all it is, right? It's just, it's lines and dots, <laughs> and it's really, really cool how varied that stuff is. And so, basically, so there's uh, the the uh, what's lacking, and then there is the research on the actual design elements, like, so the, the smallest logical uh, pieces of that design that can be used and mixed and matched to make this thing, uh, and then it's just iterating constantly. <laughs> How many iterations are on that clue token? All the uh, so day? yeah, so the clue token is now up to a hundred, I yeah, think. It crossed a um, hundred the other day. I think we every celebrated. single token in the in the Arkham uh, thing, and it's double sided, so relatively about fifty each. But they have about fifty to hundred iterations on on each of them, and we actually just got. And so basically, what will happen is that I will research, I will iterate. At some point, invariably, I will hit a wall. Uh, I will get frustrated. I will go into sort of this chaotic uh, world. Lots of I will grinding. just listen to like just the droniest uh, ambient music, put my headphones on and just like hack it out. And that's when you have to return to the research. So research iteration, research iteration, frustration, <coughs> research iteration, research iteration, uh, because the answer is always either in the research or the iteration. You can break through any sort of any sort of block that way. Uh, and so that goes on and then we test again and then we see if those work out. In fact, we actually just got new uh, feedback back from the Arkham tokens based on Steven's playtest session where they could be improved. And so yeah. back to the drawing board, you know, you, you yeah. go back and you, and you incorporate the stuff and you iterate and you research and you iterate your research and you try to find the soul uh, of the design. So really I like the beautiful. idea of those tokens having a soul. All right. That's fascinating. Next question is from Holden22 on YouTube. Hmm. Uh, with your knowledge of the tabletop gaming industry, do you think it's possible for two or three people to make a game that's decent in parentheses, balanced, competitive, etc., comparing to something like Ashes or Android Netrunner, uh, or are small groups forever doomed to fail for the lack of resources and professional experience? 100% yes. Yeah. Not even close. I mean, you're lucky. Having more than one person is a luxury, I feel like. <laughs> one thing you may not know uh, is that I think uh, as of a year ago, Applied Hat Games was five people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Red Republic yeah. Games is two, two to three, three. Two and they're on the part it's time. arena ranks. They're yeah, yeah. I did two to three. So I mean, I, I think it's definitely possible. It's a lot of work. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. There's a lot to learn. But like, I definitely think it's possible for a group of two or three people to make a successful game. Especially like, the thing that they that a smaller company has to its advantage, right, is mobility, mm -hmm. which is you can make mistakes, you can fail, you don't have an audience yet, so you're not going to like. Your brand irreparable is irreparable damage to a brand, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, like let's say you print a card and it's too good, it's like print another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like you can you can do things because your scale is so much smaller, and learn very quickly. And if you produce a really good product um, and you publish it, people are going to pay attention. Like we're yeah. always looking for great as products. as long as it's great. Stores are always looking mm -hmm. for great products, and as long as it's great, and you are continuing to push forward and support that game, 
I definitely think it's more than possible. That's the thing that's always stuck with me about um, whenever I first started learning about marketing, right, is the first rule of marketing is do you have a great product or not? Mm -hmm. Because that's it. I mean, if you don't have that, then just stop and get the great product. Well, and a lot of a lot of marketers try to cover up a bad product yeah. with good marketing. It's had, it's had a bad reputation for marketing, for scamming people and advertising and promotion and this kind of thing to basically try to get you to buy something that ultimately isn't that great. But marketing really is should just be communicating how great the product is. Mm -hmm. So if you start with a great product, which two to three people, absolutely you can do. Mm -hmm. you got to think about it write stuff down, constantly be taking notes, mm -hmm. figure out your pillars, what is the game trying to accomplish, how is the game trying to make people feel, then start play testing, ask, is it making people feel this way? Mm -hmm. Is it fun? Is it fun? It's mm -hmm. got to be is fun. It, is it doing something different? At, when you ask questions of play testers, don't lead them into the conclusion you want. Right. So don't say, was this game fun? Or was this game fun? Leave me comments about the game. Mm -hmm. What did you like most about the game? What did you like least about the game? Figure out if the things that they're listing are the things that you want them to list, mm -hmm. right? So like if we're playing Destiny, it's like, oh man, I really liked the back and forth action and I felt like I was always in control of my Destiny, let's mm -hmm. say. If that's what you're setting out to do with the game, then great, keep accomplish. moving in that direction. If they say, I really liked the fact that my cards always felt relevant, mm -hmm. it's like, well, let's figure out, may, why aren't they paying attention to the dice? Mm -hmm. Why, why mm -hmm. were the dice not the thing they were mentioning in the, mm -hmm. th in the uh, feedback? So figure that stuff out. What, how do you want people to feel? How is your game going to be unique? And contrary to popular belief, uniqueness is not necessarily a shtick. Mm -hmm. It's the first one to use card and dice in this way. The uniqueness of your game could be, it's the best designed game, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's the best designed miniatures game. Like that is a unique position that you can take. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the those are the well, things that I would suggest. And I want to add, a, add one more thing on my end, which is I don't know of a game company that didn't start in exactly that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Like it always starts with two or three people that are committed to doing something. Yeah, and they are do you? it. <laughs> are you committed? A lot. Yeah. I mean, that's, and yeah. it's like it, I mean, I, it, FFG story. Like every every game company and most board game companies that you see at like conventions and stuff mm -hmm. are three to ten people. Yeah, like it's not. Jonathan's been yeah yeah taking a lot of I got a lot, yeah well one thing is are you I think first and foremost are you willing to take feedback to make your game better right if you answer no to that then get out right because yeah. and look yourself in the mirror don't try to justify well, the feedback that you get and say well no but you didn't understand it yeah it's like no this. they understood and so here's the, here's one thing that I have learned uh, as my time as an artist taking an immense amount of critique and feedback um, <laughs> people are very 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 good at determining and telling you about the effect. I didn't feel this. I did feel this. Or even just, I don't like that. Yeah. They are awful, awful at figuring out the cause. That's what you do. That's what an expert does, is they see the effect that someone is saying, oh, well, you know, this, this felt clunky. And then they go, okay, why? You know, why is this doing that? And also to be able to understand that as the person working on the game, you're going to be too close to the game to really make judgments on it, and you need to step back. And then thirdly, as far as professional experience goes, it is just that. It is experience. You can't get it from reading. You can't get it from watching videos. You can give yourself a leg up. Uh, but just know, going into this, that you're going to be frustrated, that things are going to go way slower than you want it to, that things are going to cost way more than you want it to. A lot more. And there are way more assets and aspects of producing a game than you could even imagine. Not that you can handle. You can do it. You can make it through. Go slow. Be methodical. Write stuff down. Understand who you are and what you want to do. And just and know that frustration is part of the process. Also, trust your vision. Don't listen to people telling you all the negativity because it will happen. Mm -hmm. Regardless, there will be negative comments probably on this podcast. Mm -hmm. There will be negative comments everywhere. Everybody with a, any kind of account online can be a hero and, and type something that mm -hmm. they think is going to get under your skin. Just don't let it. Let that stuff slide off of you and find the constructive things. Mm -hmm. Like pay attention to those and trust your vision moving forward. Also, do things officially. Mm -hmm. Don't get caught in that we didn't have a contract. Yes. We didn't have a splitting of profits. We didn't have shares allocated. We didn't incorporate. We didn't LLC. Whatever it is, don't take it on good faith that don't everybody involved handshakes. is going to play it cool yeah. and just the whole time. Yeah. Like it may well happen that way, but do not risk it. Everybody needs a security blanket there so that you can work together. Mm -hmm. If you want to produce a professional game, you have to be professional through the process. So good luck. Yeah. Please yeah. do it. Good luck. Do it. Yeah, good luck. Keep your chin up. All right, final question for this podcast from Kirby Master Five on YouTube. Nice. Oh man, oh, it's oh, Kirby. Man, Steven nice. is about to be there on the go. rails. You got to rant again. Yeah, you got to rant again, dude. It's a Steven rants. Get pumped. Well, oh no, Steven <laughs> speaks. That's what it's going to be. What do you think of limit one per deck cards? Oh, no. Is that a good approach <laughs> to designing up. cards? Rev them up. Hold on. Hold on. 
Um, is it a good approach to designing cards? It's maybe the worst approach to designing cards that I can imagine. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no reason for it to exist. You already have a game system. Now, there is one reason to have it exist. If theme. it is theme. If it is a unique thing, like for instance, in Netrunner, the shards, right? So this was a whole theme thing where like there, there's only one shard piece, so it's impossible to run more than one. Uh, honestly, I still think that's entirely unnecessary because you have a unique rule for that reason. Mm -hmm. Only one can be on the board. What's in your hand is no business of the boards, and who cares? If I want consistency, I can get it. So you, you have this rule in place, X amount of cards of a card in your deck, three, four, whatever and it unique. is. And you have the unique rule, which means you can only have one of these appear in the game, so it satisfies theme. The only thing Limit 1 per deck does, it either tries to solve bad design by balancing a card based on its variance of showing up. Which is insanity. Is the worst thing on Earth. Mm -hmm. Like, Conquest suffered from this traumatically. Limit 1 per deck on the, on the signature cards, all these supports, most of them Limit 1 per deck, incredible. So what happens then, Jonathan? Let me, let me ask you this. Sure. If you and I are playing a game, we each have a Limit 1 per deck card that has been balanced to be super strong because it can only appear every so often. Right. What if mine appears at the beginning of the game and yours never appears? Mm -hmm. What do we think is going to happen <laughs> during that game? I think you can do the math it on that. It is foolish. <laughs> it is, I, I think it's actually the laziest and worst way to ever try to bring balance to a game. You already have rules in place to both accomplish theme and mm -hmm. accomplish limitations of a card. If it's so strong that it needs to be limit one per deck, make it less strong, make it cost more. Mm -hmm. It's simple. Yeah. Like, and I think it's I think it. it's way more interesting to design the card in such a way where the player is making the one of choice themselves yeah. instead of mandating that choice for Absolutely. the player. That's a that's a way that's a way stronger, more engaging sort of a feeling. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, on that note, I don't I think limit one per deck as a balance mechanic is horrible. Is ridiculous. It is like ridiculous. It, call it again, for variance. <laughs> it's absurd. Just it's absurd. Get out Beautiful. of town. Get out of town. <laughs> but I think limit one per deck as like somehow theme is like approaching acceptable to, to borrow some vernacular from back in the Let's day. Let's hope a game is never approaching uh, acceptable. Like I'm, I'm, if, if it's theme based, I'm not going to be like off the rails about it. But like if in a set of Destiny, it was like, hmm, this lightsaber is limit one per deck, I would just flip a table. <laughs> it's like it's crazy. I, and it's like just uber powerful. And it's like, well, if I draw that on turn one, I win. If you don't ever see yours, sorry. Don't do it. Yeah, Please, it's almost like you know designing a zero cost upgrade that puts other upgrades into play for free. One guy sees it, one guy doesn't. Who's going to win? Yeah, yeah. It's it's my just money's poor. on the hall. I mean, uh, the guy that gets the card. <laughs> it's Anyways, balance is lazy. It should never be done. Uh, remember, you can use hashtag Ask Covenant, <laughs> ask us questions, get our salt or our joy, one of the two. Uh, we'll tell th you. Thank you all so much for watching. I want to mention next week we're expecting to have the le living legend Matt Newman on. Yeah, uh, Arkham for, designer, lead designer for, for an interview. So we'll have him on soon to talk about Arkham and design and all that fun stuff. And uh, a real designer. Talking also, about design. final thing. We would love you to answer the question, uh, why do you prefer to play tabletop games physically or digitally? Yeah. yeah Which is your preference and why? Thanks for watching. Keep playing.